Okay, everyone, this is Donna again from the Lake Apacon Foundation. I'm, I'm welcoming you to our um, Lunch and Learn webinar that this is our eighth and final webinar for this year. And uh, Dr. Fred Lubnow will be presenting to us about the management activities to prevent, mitigate, and or control HABs at Lake Apacon. So please join me for, in virtual welcome for Dr. Lubnow. Dr. Lubnow, I'd like to turn it over to you. All right, thank you very much. And thank you for inviting me. Uh, for this uh, Lunch and Learn uh, session. So as uh, Donna mentioned, I'll be talking about the HAB grant, which was awarded to Lake Apacon uh, at the beginning of this year in response to some of the blooms that occurred in 2019. So I just wanna go over the objectives of the talk. And some of this I have presented in some earlier presentations, but I have updated uh, some of this information. Uh, I'll be talking about the unique properties of the cyanobacteria, which are also known as blue-green algae. They're the ones that produce the HABs. Almost every HAB in a freshwater system is cyanobacteria. Um, what triggered the regional blooms um, in June of 2019, and it wasn't just Lake Apacon, it was other lakes like Greenwood Lake, Lake, uh, uh, Mo lake Mohawk in New Jersey and then other lakes throughout uh, the uh, mid-Atlantic states in New York, New Jersey, Virginia, all experienced HABs at the same time. Um, uh, I'll specifically talk about Lake Apacon and its HAB grants, and then I'll be providing some preliminary data on the projects that have, have been implemented to date. So we completed a large portion of the projects um, the end of this growing season. We're going through that data. We'll be submitting a year-end report in January. And then next year, we'll be finishing up all of our projects and then submitting another year-end report next year. Uh, so this is just showing you some uh, common cyanobacteria, what they look like underneath the microscope. So in your upper left, that's called anthanazomenon. That one, if you look at it in the water, it may look like grass clippings. Uh, the one in the um, lower left is uh, microcystis. And then the one on the right is called um, it's called anabina. So uh, cyanobacteria have um, a variety of adaptations that allow them to survive in a variety of, of systems and, and environments. So number one is they can photosynthesize in a wide variety of light intensities. So they can, they can be deep in the water uh, and photosynthesize and then come up right to the surface to produce surface scums. Um, and they can survive very low light and very high light intensities. They also have resting spores called aconites. So these are larger, darker looking cells that once we get into this time of year, a lot of the, the cyanobacteria start to die back. These spores settle to the sediments, they lie dormant, and then in, in the spring when the lake mixes, those um, spores come up to the surface. Uh, warmer temperatures, they'll, they'll activate, and then you have more cyanobacteria. They also have um, uh, specific cells called heterocysts that many of them can fix nitrogen. So what that means is they're really not dependent on nitrogen in the water. The ones that have these cells called heterocysts can take all the nitrogen they want out of the atmosphere. But to do that, they need a lot of phosphorus. And that's why in freshwater systems, we focus so much on phosphorus because more phosphorus doesn't only mean more cyanobacteria, it doesn't only mean that there's more algae, it means it's more of the bad algae, the cyanobacteria, because they can survive fine in low nitrogen environments. Um, they need a lot of phosphorus, so they actually have enzymes to help cleave phosphorus off, off of organic compounds. So they're very effective at using a wide variety of sources of phosphorus. They can regulate their, water, their position in the water column through gas vacuoles, so they can move up and down the water column if they want more sunlight, they float to the surface and make those nasty surface scums, uh, and they can outcompete the other algae, the good algae. And then when they want more nutrients, they can collapse those gas vacuoles, sink to deeper waters where there are more nutrients. And then finally, they generate these large colonies, uh, and they produce cyanotoxins that, that make them generally unpleasant to eat by zooplankton, the little microanimals that eat algae. Uh, so they're not he heavily grazed on. And it's those cyanotoxins we're co concerned about in terms of the health of people, pets, and livestock. So if you want a cyanobacteria algal bloom, you really need three things. 
uh, for most of these blooms to occur. They, they like or they prefer high seasonal temperatures. They like still water conditions or thermal stratification. So again, remember they have those gas vacuoles. They like to make those surface scums. But to do that, they need still water conditions. They don't do as well when the water is really agitated or moving or mixing. And then finally, they need elevated phosphorus concentrations. So when the total phosphorus concentration is greater than 0 0.03 milligrams per liter, uh, that's when you increase the risk of having these blooms. So again, elevated water temperatures, still water conditions, and high phosphorus concentrations result in these halves. Now, in terms of, of temperature, you know, we've seen a lot of data and we've heard a lot, of, a lot about global warming. Um, this is showing you um, the average temperature in the Northeast in the United States uh, um, from the beginning of the 20th century all the way up to, you know, 2005, 2006. And you see this steady increase throughout the Northeast. What's interesting is we took, and we have a pretty good database for, for Lake Apacon. We have a 30-year database of where we've consistently monitored the lake. So I took the July surface water temperatures from Station 2. Now, Station 2 is the Mid-Lake Station, and I used that one since that one is not, that one does not get any shading from, from uh, nearshore trees or buildings, structures. So it's open water, sunlight during the summer. So I just plotted July just to see what it would, would look like. And I got this strongly significant, statistically significant increase in surface water temperatures at Lake Apacon. This is one of the reasons why we're seeing more halves is, again, they prefer the warmer water temperatures. And we indeed see that in the data we have for Lake Apacon. Now, on top of the temperature, like I said, they, they need a lot of phosphorus. And what happened in June of 2019 was an int interesting situation because, again, this didn't only affect Lake Apacon. It affected other lakes throughout New Jersey and the mid-Atlantic states. But we got into this weather pattern where we'd have these intense rain events. Uh, and they would be intense in that they would uh, dump a large amount of water in a short period of time. So we'd have these intense events of maybe, you know, a half hour or a couple of hours water would dump. And then we would have two to three days of nice sunny weather. Um, and then it would repeat itself throughout the month. And this is something that um, we saw throughout the, the North, the, the Mid-Atlantic. And it basically what it did for Lake Apacon is it, it provided enough water to rinse the watershed, put all those nutrients, particularly phosphorus into the lake. And then it gave two to three days of sunny weather to let it sit there, stew, and let the algae take it up. So that weather pattern is really what triggered a lot of those blooms in June of 2019, and this was the result. Um, so these blooms were lake-wide, not only a Lake Apacom, but a many other lakes, like I keep mentioning. Um, just, but I'm, I will focus on Lake Apacom for this presentation. So just to give you a little information, it, uh, the lake, it's the largest lake in New Jersey. It straddles Sussex and Morris County. There are five municipalities within the watershed. Four of them have lakefront property. And more than half a million people either visit or live in the watershed. So it's a heavily used uh, important water body for recreation, for ecological value, and for economic value in northern New Jersey. This map is just showing you our standard uh, stations. And you can see they're sort of in the center, that, that station two. That's the one that I showed you, that temperature data. But we collect a wide variety of data. We've been consistently doing this since the uh, late 80s, early 90s. Now, blooms, halves have not been, this isn't brand new to Lake Apacon. We have seen these blooms in the past. Here you're seeing one in October of 2017. But what made 2019 such a game changer is, usually when the halves would hit Lake Apacon, it would tend to be in the late summer, more than likely fall, early fall, mid fall. And by that time, once you hit fall and, and, and students are back in school, after, you know, the Labor Day holiday, the beaches are closed. I mean, people are still recreating, but that heavy amount of recreation at the State Park Beach, beaches in general, aren't as heavy as they are, say, at the beginning of the growing season. So even though we've seen these blooms in the past, number one, they tend to occur late in the season. And number two, they've only been more localized. So they might be in a small cove or area 
where they would accumulate, um, where in June of 2019, number one, it happened a lot earlier in the summer season, and number two, it happened throughout the entire lake. Um, and we saw blooms this year. So the blooms this year were not as uh, extensive as we saw um, in 2019. So we did get blooms. Here's one August 10th. But again, these blooms were more isolated and in smaller areas. But they weren't covering the entire lake. And this, this is just showing you that even in early November, we were seeing these blooms persist. And you know, I've been I, I've been a practicing limnologist since the early 90s, and I'm old enough that I remember back in the 90s, once we hit September and October, as soon as those cooler temperatures hit, the blue-green algae, the cyanobacteria, would just die off pretty quickly. And they'd be replaced by brown algae, like diatoms or chrysophytes. But over the last, I'd say, five to 10 years, we've been seeing this, that these blooms seem to continue to persist well into uh, October and November which you know, is problematic for all lakes, but it's particularly problematic for potable water supplies that are dealing with you know, maintaining acceptable drinking water. So we've been seeing these blooms not only become more intensive and start earlier, but now they're lingering further on. And as a matter of fact, just yesterday, I got some photos from, uh, um, from Marty Kane, who forwarded to me from an individual who lives in the River Sticks Crescent Cove section of the lake, so this is December 9th, this is yesterday, and you can see that green tinge right where the lake is starting to ice up. So these, and I, I do have to say that there are some cyanobacteria that can survive cooler water temperatures. So we are gonna take some samples and see if those are the types of cyanobacteria we see out there. But again, this is something we've been seeing more and more frequently over the last five to 10 years that these blooms just keep lingering on and on. Um, Lake Mohawk in the 90s used to have year-round blooms of cyanobacteria, um, and it wasn't until we implemented a variety of in-lake and watershed projects to really break that cycle. And so what we're seeing here is with climate change, it's allowing these, these cyanobacteria to persist uh, in other lakes. And so this is something we do have to take into account as we develop management plans and implement projects. So um, this, this slide is just showing you um, the average June total phosphorus concentration. So remember I showed you that map with all those red dots? So all those 11 stations, we took the average concentration and we've graphed them for June from 1990 all the way up to uh, 2020. And um, this can be broken down into essentially three decades. So you have the concentrations before 2000, and you can see that red line is at uh, 0.03 milligrams per liter. We want the concentrations to stay at or below that concentration. So before, before the commission was, the Lake Apacon Commission was formed, you know, we had the Lake Apacon uh, Regional Planning Board and they did a valiant effort implementing projects where they could, but they were working on a shoestring budget. You can see we had some pretty elevated phosphorus concentrations through the 90s. Once we hit the 2000s, the commission had funding. There was some very aggressive weed harvesting. Um, we re they received uh, EPA and 319 grants to implement a variety of watershed projects. And you can see through the 2000s that the phosphorus concentrations were really, you know, really were under control for the most part. And if you were around between 2000 and 2010, the biggest complaint on the lake were the weeds, that we had high concentrations of submerged aquatic vegetation, and that's what the harvesting took care of. And the harvesting not only removes weeds, but it also removes algae. So we were battling the weeds, which is what you expect when you have less algae. When there's less algae, the water is clearer. When the water's clearer, more sunlight hits the sediments. And so look at 2010. Once we hit 2010, and that was, you know, at the tail end of the recession of, 20, uh, of 2008. Um, so there was a lot of funding cuts, not only with the commission, but also shared service agree uh, uh, agreements, having, you know, their own operational staff to do the harvesting, to clean out catch basins, and the grant funding also, um, those projects were completed. So once we hit into 2010, there wasn't a lot of funding uh, left for, you know, the, the weed harvesting program was a fraction of what it used to be. Um, there was limited amounts of funding for this, these types of projects. And you can see through the 2000s, the total phosphorus concentration was slowly creeping up. And if you look at 2009, June, 
Uh, and those, those values were collected about a week before the bloom hit in June. The average concentration was above 0 0.04. And that's the first time that happened in over 20 years. And that was a tipping point. Once that average June concentration hit greater than 0 0.04, that's when we had that massive bloom. Now, 2020 was better. You can see the June 2020 concentration was lower than 0 0.04. Um, but this is why we're focusing so much on keeping the phosphorus under control, because we know when these concentrations are elevated, this is what triggers these halves. And this, this was the result, result of these elevated phosphorus concentrations. So now I'm going to get into the actual HAB grant. So um, DEP made uh, funding available for uh, HAB mitigation, uh, control and management. Um, 2020, the Lake Capacon Commission uh, submitted a grant. Uh, they partnered with the Lake Capacon Foundation, as well as Sussex and Morris County, um, the Township of Jefferson, Borough of Mount Arlington, Borough of Hapacon, Township of Roxbury, uh, partnered with Rutgers University, um, as well as ourselves. And um, even before the HABs hit, we were working on updating their watershed management plan. And I, I do have to say that funding came through through the New Jersey Highlands Council. So it just so happened we were updating their watershed plan. That was initiated in 2018. So in a way it was sort of, it sort of fit well that we were working on the watershed plan and then the HABs hit, it just emphasized the need for this plan. Um, but the uh, commission requested uh, half a million dollars. They received it. They had a match of 300,000, which was a combination of funding, money, as well as in kind. Um, the counties themselves provided up to $25,000. Uh, the foundation provided funding, the commission provided funding, and then the, the townships have provided a wide variety of in-kind contributions. And Rutgers also provided some in-kind match uh, for the project that, that they're working on. So I'm gonna go through what we've accomplished in 2020 uh, to date. So um, the first project we implemented was we used Foslock to treat um, a section of um, the southern end of, of Lake Apacon. Phoslock is a clay-based product that basically clings on to phosphorus and makes it unavailable for algae growth. So it's familiar, if you're familiar with alum, alum is aluminum sulfate, which is very frequently used in, in either drinking water facilities or in recreational lakes as a way to remove phosphorus from the water column or from the sediments. Um, we decided to try Phoslock um, because it doesn't have aluminum in it, um, number one. Number two, the Phoslock will inactivate organic phosphorus as well as inorganic, where the, the alum only focuses on inorganic. Um, and I do want to emphasize that every management technique we were talking about has its advantages, its limitations, and its costs. So the advantage to Phoslock is it doesn't have aluminum, that it inactivates that organic phosphorus, but the disadvantage is, is the phoslock is substantially more expensive than, um, uh, than standard alum is. Um, but we did a, uh, and I'll get into that treatment in just a second. Um, we also used an alternative to, to a copper-based algicide. So most of your algicides nowadays are copper-based. You know, once copper's in, in the system, it settles to the bottom, and that copper can have negative impacts in terms of the general health of the ecosystem, but more importantly, if, if you're using too much copper over decades, heavy amounts of copper, when you, if you want to dredge, you may have to dispose of that material in a special manner because it may be deemed as, as hazardous because of the elevated copper concentrations. So we looked into using a strong oxidizing algaecide, an alternative to copper-based algaecides. Again, the advantage is this green clean does not have copper. Disadvantage is it's more expensive. We also used biochar, and I'll get into that in just a second and, and show you some data. We had a program for a two acre cove on the lake called Ashley Cove. We implemented a variety of projects. I'll talk about that a little. Um, we've installed, we're, we're planning to install three nearshore aeration technologies to evaluate how nearshore aeration can benefit a beach area in terms of reducing or eliminating halves. So of those, aeration projects, two have been installed. The third one will be installed in spring of next year. Um, I'll also be talking about biochar being installed in, in some large stormwater structures called aquafilters. And then um, 
while we weren't associated with it, you know, Rutgers University has implemented a very proactive, very positive rain garden program to get local uh, uh, property owners interested in installing rain gardens that help to reduce the, 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 the nutrient loads that go into the lake. So I'm just gonna go into these projects. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the project and I'll give you some preliminary data that we're actually working on right now. Um, so like I mentioned, Phoslock, it's a clay-based product that inactivates phosphorus. It does not have aluminum. Instead, it uses lithanthium to bind with the uh, phosphorus. It can be used to strip the water column of phosphorus and inactivate deep water phosphorus from the deep waters. Um, it can also be used to inactivate phosphorus in shallow areas. And that's why we picked um, landing channel to do this treatment is we wanted to see how effective it would be at controlling phosphorus coming up from shallow sediments. Again, the disadvantage to the phospholock is it's substantially more expensive than alum or, or other similar products. So this is just showing you the treatment area. Uh, this was done in June. It was a 50 acre, 50 acre area. It was uh, one of the largest treatments in the United States uh, conducted for phospholock. And again, the goal was to uh, minimize the amount of phosphorus coming from those uh, uh, shallow sediments. This is showing you the treatment uh, that we did. So we applied a, a total amount of 22,000 pounds of the product, which was about 440 pounds per acre over the 50 acres. It was done over the course of three days. Um, so using GPS, um, you know, we, we uh, and, and a uh, metered um, pump, we applied the product. Uh, and just to put this in context, some of the water quality goals we have for Lake Capacon in general, which these goals are based on the watershed implementation plan that was recently updated. So as I mentioned, we want to keep concentrations of total phosphorus at or below 0 0.03 milligrams per liter. We would like to keep the average chlorophyll A concentration, and chlorophyll A is a photosynthetic pigment that all algae have. We want to keep it at about eight, the average concentration over the growing season. We'd like to keep the maximum concentration, the highest amount we want to see over the course of the growing season, at about 14, a little under 14. And we want the Secchi depth. And the Secchi de disc is an alter alternating black and white disc that you lower into the water. We want to keep the clarity at one meter or greater. So that's about 3.3 feet. If the clarity is less than a meter, that's when most people will say, yeah, the water looks a little dirty. It looks a little scummy. I don't know if I'd want to swim in that. So those are the water quality goals. And here's some of the data from Landing Channel. And again, this is preliminary because um, we're, we're working on these reports right now. I, I really want to focus more on the, um, on the slide on the right, which is samples collected directly from uh, the, immediately above the sediments. Um, so we have three parameters there. We have total dissolved phosphorus, we have total phosphorus, and we have soluble reactive phosphorus. What I'll say is total phosphorus you can think of as food for algae. Soluble reactive phosphorus is like candy. It's inorganic, it's dissolved, it's the first thing the algae are gonna take up. So it's really that SRP that we wanted to keep under control. And indeed, when we look at our data, so if you look at that slide over to the right, you can see June 12th, that was just before we did the treat, initiated the treatment on the 15th. You can see we had slightly elevated SRP concentrations, um, we had uh, slightly elevated total phosphorus concentrations. And then we resampled on the 24th, which was, uh, you know, at least a week after the treatment was done. All three parameters declined. Um, and then once we got into June, what we saw was SRP remained low. We did see an increase in TDP and TP, but we know that we had a pretty big, pretty significant storm event a day or two before that sampling event. So we're attributing the elevated TP to the storm event because we did see elevated concentrations of phosphorus throughout the watershed, not throughout the lake, not just in landing channel. Um, but the SRP maintained those low concentrations once we moved further into the growing season into August and all the parameters declined. And um, the slide over to the left is showing the same data, but it's showing it for the surface water concentration. So it's interesting that SRP did actually increase in the surface waters. Um, again, that's more than likely attributed to the watershed. We have to compare that to our long-term data. Um, 
uh, but it, it did stay low in those earlier events, did increase in the surface water, but yet stayed low um, in the deep water. And when I say um, deep or surface in landing channel, we're only talking depths of about, you know, six to nine feet. It's not a real deep, it's not like the middle of the lake where you're down like 50 feet. You're, you're talking, you know, less than 10 feet in depth in landing channel. So just to let everyone know, we're going to continue to monitor next year because one of the goals is how long is the effectiveness of this phospholock? Do Could we get multiple years of control of this phosphorus? And then also just to show you some other data um, that, that we're crunching through. So um, some of the algae data in the upper right, this is showing you cyanobacteria cell counts. It also shows you phycocyanin, which is a pigment specific for the cyanobacteria and chlorophyll A, which is all, what the pigment all algae possess. And again, we saw overall low concentrations except for that July event, which was a couple days after a, uh, after a rain event. So again, we're attributing a lot of the, that elevation due to the rain event that happened a couple days previously. But what is promising is when you look at Secchi depth, um, it was consistently at one meter or greater throughout the growing season. So that was a, that was a positive sign that we helped uh, to improve conditions in landing channel with the phospholock treatment. So, and this is just showing you the treatment that was done for green clean. So this was just, this was a small area. This was a two acre area to demonstrate if this can be an effective algicide, uh, an alternative to copper based products. Um, this was done at Cap Beach in, in the township of Jefferson, permitted activity. It's a strong oxidizer. Um, and again, it's more expensive than copper-based products. And so what we saw was, um, we did see an increase in Secchi depth, which was good. We went from 0.8 to one meter, um, but we did see an increase in chlorophyll A and phycocyanin. So in spite of the increased clarity, we did have more algae. Um, but keep in mind, if you look at that shoreline, if you're familiar where Cat Beach is, it's, it's in an open area of the lake. It's not an isolated cove or bay. So I'm going to compare this to what some of the results we saw at Ashley Cove, which is more isolated. So this is something that I think um, lake users have to keep in mind that when you're deciding on a beach or a nearshore restoration plan, you have to keep in mind where you are relative to the main body of the lake, because an area like this that's exposed to the main body of the lake, any sort of treatment is going to have reduced effectiveness um, uh, relative to something that's more isolated. I'm going to shift to the biochar. So biochar is processed wood material, and it, it's, it's basically burnt up wood material that has a high affinity to remove pollutants. Um, so we conducted a feasibility assessment to identify locations where we could install the biochar. Um, so we selected four stream sites, two stormwater ponds in the watershed, and two stormwater manufacturer treatment devices. Um, so we had a training session with all four municipalities because the long term is to have the municipalities um, use the biochar. And biochar has a lot of advantages going, going for it. Number one, it's low in cost. It's not expensive. And number two is once you're done with the biochar, you can use it as landscaping mulch. So when we introduced this to the, um, the participants and they were all um, either municipal administrators or they were members of the Department of Public Works. They were all very excited about this because number one, it's cheap. Uh, it's not expensive like some of the other filter media you put in stormwater devices. And number two, what do you do with it? That was one of the biggest complaints people had with any filter media. How do I get rid of this stuff? Well, if they can use it as mulch, that's great. So we, we evaluated um, how the biochar can be used. And this is showing you those three methods um, we use, so if you look in the lower right, you can see Katie and Ivy, two of our field team members installing some biochar in the streams. On the left, that's showing you one of the manufacturer treatment devices where we laid the biochar. So they're put into this filter sleeve and those were uh, installed into the stormwater device. And then in the upper right, you can see one of the stormwater ponds where we installed the biochar. So I'm gonna go through some of the data. So, so far, uh, we've completed our stream assessments. Um, we did two sampling events. They were, they were installed in the streams the 2nd of July. And we got variable, um, variable removal rates. So after eight days, we had anywhere, and again, four locations between no removal and up to 55%. And then for SRP, that candy 
for the algae. We were getting between two and like 58%. So we were getting some pretty variable removal rates. And again, that's not surprising because a lot of factors come into play. What's the volume of the stream water flowing during that storm event? How much phosphorus is in the water at the time? Uh, so there are a lot of variables that come into play. Um, after three and a half months though, we were getting low to no removal rates. So what, what that tells us with stream installations is, if we're gonna install them in streams, they more than likely have to be replaced about once, every, less than three months. So we'll be playing around with this a little more next year to see if you install it in, in a stream, do you wanna remove it after two months? Um, but I, I have to say some of the removal rates we were getting like between 55 and 58%, those are pretty good comparing to say a manufactured treatment device that has no filtering material. You're only removing about 30 to 40%. So we were getting some variable responses with the streams. Um, the stormwater ponds though, however, we were getting some really good removal rates. So this is showing you for the two ponds, we installed Duck Pond and Memorial Pond. We installed the biochar and after three months, we were still getting some pretty high removal rates between 60 and 80% for total phosphorus. And then 97% for SRP after three months in the stormwater ponds. And this was not shocking to us. You know, we did talk to the manufacturer and the manufacturer did emphasize that the longer the contact time between the water um, and the biochar, the higher the removal rate. So he, when we were talking to him, he was not surprised at all that we were getting higher removal rates in the stormwater ponds compared to the streams. So we still need to do sampling for the manufacturer treatment devices. Uh, we've been experimenting with particle size in the manufacturer tre treatment devices. So we'll be continuing the monitoring next year. Um, what we do wanna do though next year is instead of the streams, I'd like to install the um, biochar where the stream enters the lake similar to like the stormwater ponds to see if we can increase that removal rate because you know as the water's flowing you know as the as the stream is flowing through the biochar um there's not a lot of contact time once that stream or inlet enters the pond and the water slows down if we can have some of those biochars uh sleeves floating right in front of that area that may really help to increase removal rates of phosphorus so we'll be experimenting with that next year um, and this is showing you before, after, before and after the biochar in Ashley Cove. I do want to say though, uh, so again, this is Ashley Cove in Jefferson Township. Um, we've not only installed the biochar, and if you look at the photo on the um, left, you can see one of the biochar sleeves in, in, the, lower, in the lower left. Um, and then after we did get a uh, significant reduction in the amount of the uh, cyanobacteria, the halves. But I wanna emphasize that with Ashley Cove, not only did we install biochar, but we also conducted these low dose treatments of Phoslock and we did one green clean treatment to get the algae under control. So in Ashley Cove, we're doing multiple projects. So we did one green clean treatment, we've done multiple Phoslock treatments and we've installed biochar. Next year we'll be installing some new floating wetland islands in Ashley Cove, as well as revamping some old islands that were installed in the Cove a few years ago. So we're, we think we're in the right, we're moving in the right direction with Ashley Cove because back in July of 2012, um, we were getting concentrations of total phosphorus in the Cove of, of about 0 0.07 milligrams per liter. The nice thing about what we saw this year is you can look at the data in the lower right and, and the, um, if you look at the uh, uh, blue bar, that's showing total phosphorus. Total phosphorus did not exceed 0 0.04 through the course of the growing season this year. So we feel we're, in a, we're moving in the right direction. Uh, we did see, again, a bump uh, in early September of cyanobacteria, phycocyanin, and chlorophyll A. But surprisingly, in early October, even though there were cyanobacteria th still throughout the lake, there were no cyanobacteria in Ashley Cove. Um, so we did have some submerged aquatic plant growth, but what we're really trying to do is mitigate and avoid the development of those hab blooms. So um, what we're gonna do for next year at Ashley Cove, like I mentioned, we're gonna install the floating wetland islands and we'll continue with the biochar and the phoslock. We're not gonna do the green clean. We're gonna see if we can be more proactive in Ashley Cove 
and start maybe a little earlier, like in April or May, get, get everything going, try to avoid the blooms from appearing in the first place. So that's what we'll be doing there. And uh, I'm, I'm hoping we can get the phosphorus concentration at or below our targeted goal of 0 0.03 milligrams per liter. So I mentioned also we installed three innovative aeration systems. So these aren't, these aren't the whole lake aeration systems that you see at like Lake Mohawk or Culver Lake or Swartzwood. These are near shore systems that are really designed to, to disrupt the habitat or make conditions unsuitable for halves. So um, we installed three different innovative technologies. The first one was an air curtain and we've been using air curtains for years. Um, so it's typically done at a beach location and what it's doing, it's just agitating the water. It makes it more difficult for the, for the habs to accumulate along a beach shoreline. So we installed an air curtain at Shore Hills Country Club, Roxbury Township that was done in uh, early November of this year. Uh, and then at the Lake Forest Yacht Club at Jefferson Township, we're installing a nano bubble system with ozone. And these are relatively new, this is relatively new technology. These are the first nano bubble systems that we're installing. And this one has ozone, which helps to break up uh, the algae. Uh, so more expensive than just a nano bubble system. And there's a, more of a demand in terms of electricity. That one was installed, um, it, it's, it's installed now. I, it says it was mostly complete, it has been completed. So the third one is just a nano bubble system. That's gonna be at Mount Arlington Municipal Beach uh, in the borough of Mount Arlington. We'll be installing that one in 2021. So once all the systems are in, probably April, early May, we'll start them up and then we'll evaluate how they are at eliminating or minimizing the development of HABs along these three areas. And we wanna evaluate each one to see, you know, which one is more cost effective, um, which one did we have uh, problems with in terms of maintenance? So it's a way of evaluating this. And I got to say all municipalities, you know, they were very, um, very positive, very proactive. They were very excited about these projects. And they, you know, they were, they were the ones providing the electricity hookups and all the uh, infrastructure coordination. So they really helped quite a bit. And that's quite a bit of their in-kind match. This is just showing you the installation of the Shore Hills Air Curtain. And this is the nano bubble system. So that middle photo, um, the compressor, the aeration compressor is the large green box. That small blue box is the ozone generator. Um, so those two systems were installed. The one at Mount Arlington will be installed uh, early spring of next year. So the remaining projects we're working on is we're working on cleaning out two aquafilter stormwater manufacturer treatment devices. Those are two large stormwater structures in the borough of Apacon. So we've been closely working with them, um, getting it up to par so that the, um, the borough will be cleaning out the pre-treatment systems, which are called aqua swirls. And then we're going to hire a contractor to come in and clean out the large aqua filter systems uh, and, and put filter media with biochar into them. So these are large stormwater structures that we want to evaluate the effectiveness of the biochar in these structures. And Number one, I gotta thank the borough. The borough has been very positive and very proactive. They've been working with us. We're working with them and the contractor we'll be using. We're hoping to get this completed before the end of this year. Uh, matter of fact, we may be like a, 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 maybe a week away from cleaning the basins out. If not, we'll have to do it at the beginning of the year. Um, but we've been working quite a bit on um, getting this project up and going. But these two large stormwater structures they drain, um, well, it's like, I think 110 acres of drainage area. So they filter out a lot of land and a lot of pollutants. So these are one of the areas, and, and these are located in the um, parking lot of the um, Borough of Apacons uh, Beach Club. So it's, you know, a beach area. It's a large drainage area. These two stormwater structures are filtering out a lot of material. So we wanna see if we can increase that effectiveness with the biochar. Um, in addition to this, I mentioned that Rutgers University has been working closely, not only with Lake Apacon Commission, but also the foundation to oversee a rain garden workshop. So they've done at least one um, uh, education and training session. Uh, and they have another one uh, either scheduled before the holidays or, or in the spring of, of, of next year. Um, but I've heard a lot of positive uh, feedback on those on those on that program, and then finally, um, we are evaluating the effectiveness of you know we will continue to evaluate the effectiveness of the uh, nearshore aeration systems 
uh, once as we move into 2021. Um, so I'm going to hit on some conclusions, then I'll show you just a little more data that I think if you live in a pack con or any lake, you may want to see. Uh, so the conclusions are, you know, high water temperatures, still water conditions, and elevated phosphorus concentrations really foster the development of these halves in freshwater systems. Uh, number two, the Lake Apacon and all the associated, the Lake Apacon Commission and all the associated stakeholders are implementing a variety of projects. We've implemented a whole batch of them this year. We'll be uh, implementing the rest next year and about this time next year, we'll probably report, be reporting on all of the projects and summarizing the conclusions and really the, the goal to have this information is not just for Lake Apacon, but it's for all the lakes in New Jersey, that there are a, a list of innovative technologies that we lay out where they work, where they're limited in terms of work, what their costs are. So everyone has a good sense of what may or may not be applicable for your lake or your beach. The last thing I want to mention is, um, so I mentioned phycocyanin is a, is a pigment all cyanobacteria have. So it's an excellent surrogate to cyanobacteria cell counts. Now to do a cyanobacteria cell count, you grant, whether it's DEP, whether it's Rutgers, or whether it's us as the environmental consultant, you grab the sample, you preserve it, you go back to the lab, you have to wait for the cells to sink, and then you have to go through this microscopic analysis, and then you have to put the data into the computer. It can easily take days to get that data. And so that's why a lot of times uh, on the HAB New Jersey website, it would take days to get the data up. It's because it's not immediate. You have to take the sample, preserve it, settle it. You have to do the counts. You have to enter the data. So there's amount of time that's involved with that. Um, DEP has recognized that and they've been um, talking about using these phycocyanin meters as a surrogate for cyanobacteria cell counts. So, so for this year, every time we grabbed a cyanobacteria cell sample, we also took a reading of phycocyanin, and we found a pretty significant, uh, highly correlated trend between phycocyanin and cyanobacteria cell counts in Lake Apacon. So the value to this is, once we have the report finalized, we can provide this information. This means either a, you know, a, a, a homeowner community or a beach club can invest in one of these meters, or I know DEP is making them available um, for, for temporary rental to use. Um, the advantage to that is you can dunk this meter in, get a reading of phycocyanin, and then compare it to the state thresholds. You know, so it will translate it to what the approximate cell count will be, and then you can see where you are on your advisory. So that's really important because that's real-time information. And if you're familiar with, with HABs, I mean, they, they're very dynamic. You could have a nasty HAB in the morning and by the afternoon, it can be gone because of wind and prevailing weather. So this is a way of collecting that real-time data to get a sense of how the HABs interact with your near shoreline area. And I, I did want to emphasize that because that's, that was one of the things that we, were, uh, that we wanted to do with the data that was being collected that I think everyone will benefit from. Um, you know, and, and these meters aren't that expensive. You know, one meter, one of these meters just to measure phycocyanin, my, my, I think it's like maybe... Um, yeah, uh, $1,000 or, or 1200 bucks. they're not that expensive. Now, as consultants, we're actually investing, because of all the HAB work we're doing, we're getting some new large meters that measure all sorts of parameters, like dissolved oxygen, temperature, phycocyanin, chlorophyll A. But again, this is something I think that the commission, the foundation, the townships, you know, in the future may want to uh, um, either invest in or, or take advantage of DEP's offer to make such probes available. Um, so that's what I have. I know that was a lot of information and, and we're still crunching through the data, uh, but I thank you for your time. Thank you, Fred. That was very helpful. Um, we appreciate all you sharing all your knowledge with us. Um, I do want to just take a um, um, little bit of time. We've had a few questions and comments in the chat. So if you would just bear with me as I read through them. Um, we had a um, question, uh, Question from Idly, um, asking that, saying thank you for the great presentation. And they, she was inquiring if you looked at wild ponds in the northeastern part of the lake. I, I wasn't familiar with that location, and 
I live in the northeastern section of the lake, and I asked her to be a little more specific, and she said it's a small pond off of Ripplewood Drive in Lake Forest. Um, I just, before you respond to that, Fred, I just want to emphasize that when Princeton Hydro selects the location, they look at a lot of different variables when they make the recommendations to the commission of where to implement projects. And in the Woodport section, two of the projects that Fred mentioned, the one aeration system that's being implemented is at the Lake Forest Yacht Club, and also there is a stream that comes into uh, the back of Lake Forest that goes through a pipe, and there, they also put some biochar filters in that location as well. So there are two projects that are being done in the Woodport section. But Fred, do you want? Are you familiar with that pond? You know, I'm not, but um, I'll tell you, any any pond like that is an excellent candidate for the biochar. And I really didn't get into this, but um, what we did see with the biochar is not only does it help to clean the water up before it goes into Lake Apacon, but we also see in that water body it being cleaned up because you're removing the phosphorus in that pond. So um, the project manager, J.P. Bell, um, he was the one who was really keeping tabs on, on things for Duck Pond and Memorial Pond. And I, I can't remember which one, but one of the ponds cleaned up and stayed clean. The other one cleaned up, but it went into like almost cycles that it would look good, then it would get a bloom and then it would disappear. Um, and he said that a lot of that talking to the manufacturer of the biochar really depends on how much is coming off the sediment. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. I, I'll make sure to keep that pond in mind because that's something we definitely, you're, 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 you're actually getting two benefits. You're benefiting the, that pond, even though it's a stormwater pond, it's still a local aesthetic amenity for the people who live around it. So if you can clean that up with the biochar, that's good. And if you're removing those nutrients that otherwise go into Lake Apacon, you're helping Lake Apacon. I think, you know, the real key is to make sure that the biochar is replaced on a routine basis. Um, like I said, we got three months of good control in the ponds. I'm hoping we can get maybe six months and that might be pushing it, but I would love six months because I see, you know, the, the public works departments installing biochar at the beginning of the growing season and then once you hit around, you know, uh, April, May, and then once you hit like around September, they can then remove the biochar, put new biochar in or, or wait till the next growing season. But that way they can use that mulch, you know, for their landscaping in the fall. But I'll definitely keep that pond in mind because we're, the highest removal rates we've been seeing are in standing water. Okay, thank you, Fred. Um, we have our next question is from uh, Lawrence Orland, Larry Orlands. He's asking if the phosphate reductions in landing channel only lasted one month due to a heavy rainstorm event, is that a really effective treatment considering its cost? Right, and that, that's what we're exactly evaluating because you're right, we did have a heavy storm event and it affected the whole lake, but we did see landing improve after that storm relative to the rest of the lake. So landing actually was in a pretty good state in August compared to the rest of the lake where we saw some elevated phosphorus, con some of the phosphorus concentrations in August, some of the sampling stations went up as high as 0 0.08, where it stayed relatively low in landing channel. So you're right, what we wanna do is we wanna see, is that something that's consistent over multiple years? Because this is an expensive product. I mean, we use phospholock, but when we use it, it's, it tends to be in very small areas, like a couple acres. I think before Hapacom, the largest treatment we've done is like a 20 acre pond. So it, because it's a very expensive product, it's effective, but it's expensive. And you're right, it was, it was that rain event that brought it in. Now, if we go into a period where we have a dry summer, you actually may see conditions look great in landing channel, but other areas where phosphorus is coming up from the sediments, you may have more of a problem, such as River Sticks, Crescent Cove, or some of the shallow areas near shore areas up in uh, Jefferson. So that's one of the reasons why we did the treatment is to evaluate its effectiveness. Thank you, Fred. Um, we have another question from Kirsten Begg. She's referring to herself as a newbie. She's asking if the phosphorus is coming from lawn fertilizer runoff or other storm runoff, or where is it from? So could you just talk briefly a little bit about our non-point source pollution issues in Lake Apacon that we're trying to address, Fred? Absolutely. So. Um, there are three major culprits of phosphorus in the watershed. Um, 80 to 90, I'd say 80% of the phosphorus is coming in from 
stormwater and septic. And septic is a little more than the stormwater. So it's the septic leachate and it's surface runoff stormwater. And the stormwater includes lawn fertilizer, uh, pet waste, goose poop. Um, anywhere you have an eroded stream bank or shoreline, those soil particles have a lot of phosphorus attached to them. So we always try, that's one of the re reasons why we're really looking into stream bank and shoreline stabilization because any exposed dirt that washes into the lake brings phosphorus in, into it. So it's a wide variety of sources. So from the watershed, it's mostly stormwater and septic. And on an annual basis, that's at least 80% of the load. Another 10% comes in from uh, the atmosphere and another 10% comes in from the sediments. Now we do have a 319 grant um, where we're gonna evaluate what's coming up from those deep water sediments because um, the deep water sediments, they go anoxic uh, which means they run out of oxygen over the summer. And when you run out of oxygen, the bond between iron and phosphorus is broken. So you have all this phosphorus coming up from the sediments. And the th remember the blue greens, they have those gas vacuoles so they can go down to the deeper waters, fuel up on all that phosphorus and then go right to the surface. On an annual basis, the internal load only accounts for 10% of the load. But what we wanna see is, if you break that down on a monthly or, or a seasonal, say summer, basis. Is that load larger? And is it larger for a dry growing season? Because what was interesting was we worked with another lake in Pennsylvania called Harvey's Lake. It's very deep and it had the same hab that a PACCON did at the same time, June of, of 2019. Harvey's in two weeks cleared up. A PACCON stayed throughout the whole season. And the one big difference between the two lakes is Harvey's Lake's internal load is very, very low because it has oxygen all the way to the bottom. Even though it's like 70 feet deep, it has a lot of groundwater flowing through it. So, so oxygen to the bottom. Where Hapacon, you know, 2019, you know, once we got into the midsummer, it was a pretty, pretty stable year in terms of weather. So that dry season may have allowed the blue greens to continue to fuel up on that, on that internal load. So we're, we're actually looking into whether or not that's a contributing factor on a monthly or a seasonal basis. But those are your three main culprits of phosphorus. Thank you, Fred. Um, we only have a few minutes left, Fred, and I have quite a you know, couple of questions yep. left. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll try to be briefer. Sorry about that. <laughs> so um, Kirsten's also asking if there's any methods to reduce the phosphorus at the source rather than after it's in, its, um, in the system once it's in the lake. So I'd like to suggest to Kirsten that she go to the Lake Apacon Foundation website. We have a lake-friendly living guide that's available for um, you to review that will answer a lot of those questions for you. Um, and um, I encourage everyone to try to, um, you know, implement, you know, as many green infrastructure projects like installing rain gardens, using rain barrels. If you live on the lake to put a shoreline buffer along your property, these things will significantly help. But in the interest of time, I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, this is um, kind of a long question from John Kurzman, so I'm going to read it kind of quickly. Fred, as Foslock showed, much comes much comes from the bottom of the lake already there, but the chart of phosphorus showed that the BGA only became a problem after phosphorus was reduced, not an issue in the 90s. Lowering phosphorus is commendable as a general ecological approach, but nothing here has shown that BGA is improved by the lower phosphorus that we already now have, or that higher phosphorus on its own is the key ingredient. Less cyanobacteria occurred when we when we had the higher phosphorus we're now trying to avoid. See, I, I disagree with that because the, 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 those huge blooms we had in 2019 were triggered by elevated phosphorus. It's, it was the first time in 20 years that phosphorus concentrations throughout the whole lake not only exceeded 0 0.03 milligrams per liter, but they exceeded 0 0.04 milligrams per liter. So we had elevated phosphorus concentrations and that's really what stimulated that. The other thing you got to keep in mind, too, is back in the 90s, um, I, like I said, back in the 90s, when we, um, climate change wasn't as much of a problem as it is now. So we, back in the 90s, I'm going to date myself, I remember going on Lake Apacon, Mohawk, Swartzwood, Greenwood, and having to cut through two feet of ice to grab samples in the winter. And now you're lucky if you get ice. So we don't have those heavy winters. 
we have warmer water temperatures. And so that only allows the blue-green algae to take advantage of any phosphorus that's available there. And that's why they don't crash in September, October like they used to. It's why they continually persist. It's the warmer water. We can't locally do anything about the warmer conditions, but what we can do is make sure phosphorus is as low as possible. And I do want to say that the clarity did sustain where we wanted to be. We did see an increase in phosphorus, but again, that increase in landing channel was attributed to that storm event washing phosphorus in throughout the water column. So it's really the key is trying to keep that sediment phosphorus under control. And we did see reductions of the blue-green algae. I didn't provide the data, but we did see reductions in blue-green algae at Ashley Cove with the phospholock that was done there. Oh, thanks, Fred. So we had a question um, where, what streams were the biochar installed in? So I know it's that pipe coming in, like I mentioned, behind the Lake Forest Yacht Club. It was also in the stream that runs across from Lee's County Park by the uh, school there, the elementary yeah. school right there. So there are the two that I'm aware of the streams. Were there any other locations? I know you talked about the two ponds, Memorial yeah. Pond in, um, in Mount Arlington and Duck Pond in Roxbury? Yeah, uh, what I, probably the easiest thing to do is I'll, I'll send you, because we did this whole feasibility assessment where we, uh, we did surveys of all the streams in the area and all the stormwater infrastructures, and then the sites we identified were there. So I don't have that at my fingertips. But what I can do, Don, is I can send them to you and then you can provide them with anyone who just emails the foundation. Okay, um, and then I had a question about, um, there was a question from Rob Bond about the biochar, but I think JP and the Princeton Hydro staff um, answered his question. Um, Kirsten is also asking, are the rain garden workshops to produce rainwater buffer areas to slow prevent runoff? What is the goal of the rain gardens? And as we said, the rain garden, the, the, the reason we install the rain gardens around is it is a a green infrastructure and it will help reduce the amount of phosphorus and nutrients going into the lake that the the vegetation in the rain garden actually absorbs those nutrients. Is there anything further, Fred, you'd like to add on that? No, you hit it on the head and I can say from, from experience, we've, we've installed what are called biofiltration systems, which are large system, large rain garden systems, and you get some of the highest removal rates of, of all nutrients, not just phosphorus, but nitrogen with rain gardens, because anytime you have a structure that, see those, those stormwater structures that just settle out the solids, you're only getting 30 to 40% removal. But anytime you add green, so you hear green infrastructure, and that's the thing about a rain garden, it's all that vegetation, that's sucking up a lot of that dissolved phosphorus. You can get removal rates of easily 80, 90%, and you're not only removing the phosphorus that's stuck on the soil particles, you're removing that candy, that dissolved phosphorus, because that's what the vegetation and the associated microorganisms with the vegetation, they're taking all that up. So anytime you can add vegetation along, the sh along your shoreline, along a stream bank, you know, in, in a BMP, in, in a rain garden, anytime you can put native vegetation, that just helps to lock up that phosphorus so it doesn't go into the lake. Thank you, Fred. Um, Rob Bond is asking, is pH involved in assessing the effectiveness of the River Styx Crescent Cove nano bubbler installed in 2020? And Rob, I can tell you that Princeton Hydro is not a consultant on that project, but the Borough of Apacon has shared that uh, their consultants report with the foundation, the commission, and we pass that on to Princeton Hydro. And that report is available on um, on, on the Borough of Apacon's website. I believe they have a press release uh, there with that information and the report itself is available. Um, Fred, anything else you want to add on that? Um, the only thing I'll mention is we do have a long-term monitoring station in River Sticks Crescent Cove. And so what we'll do as part of our annual year-end report, we'll assess before and after, you know, what the water quality data was like at our long-term station. It's called station three what it was like before and after the aeration system was installed. So that will be included in this year's year end report. Okay, so I know we're technically a minute over our one hour lunch and learn, but I just wanna just address two more quick questions. Sure. John Kurzman is asking, 
Um, if the cyanobacteria can move away by the afternoon due to wind, isn't that a reason to rethink the DEP guidelines even further, shutting down areas for days when the conditions could change minutes later? And John, I can tell you that the, um, the foundation, the commission, as well as Dr. Lubnow, um, mayors and administrators from the four towns around the lake were just on a call with um, a wide range of personnel from the Department of Environmental Protection today. And we were told that they are, um, they are looking at the, their HAB strategy plan again to look at, you know, how they could adjust that plan. And as Fred mentioned, the department is also making a, a loan program available of those meters and is, are looking for volunteers that would be able to take those meter readings and make them available to the Department of Environmental Protection. And that's why that's the way the department is trying to be more responsive. So these, you know, when we have these have advisories that they could possibly come off the advisory list quicker if we mm -hmm. have data that we can get to them. Fred, do you have anything else you want to um, add? Just that, you know, if you, it's one thing to say, oh, we have HABs in the morning and not in the afternoon. But if, if, if a community has data, phycocyanin data, you can present to DEP, it means a lot more. And, and like, like Donna mentioned, they're, they're, they're trying to be more adaptive to see how we can uh, deal with this, not only on a local basis, but on a more regional basis. And that information may help a beach to decide if they want to implement something to address that have, even if it only happens half a day. Okay. Um, and then Larry is asking about a, can we purchase the meters at a reduced cost? <laughs> Larry, we're going to try to borrow them from the DEP before we can purchase them. If they have them on loan, that would be the most cost effective way to go. Yeah, and I'm not a salesman for Turner or, or Institute or, or YSI, so I, I don't, you know, I, I'm, not a man, I'm not a distributor for any of them. Um, Holly Odgers on our staff, who's on vacation today, but is listening. Uh, she was kind enough to post in the chat the guide for the Lake Friendly. Excuse my telephone ringing. Um, and also just a quick comment, Fred, that someone commented that Wild Pond is also referred to as Ashley Cove. So I didn't realize oh, okay. that was another name. So we are doing those projects in okay. Ashley Cove, as you mentioned already. And I think with that, we would like to conclude our Lunch and Learn. We'd like to thank Dr. We Dr. Fred Lubnow. Thanks, Fred. For Great job. His time. Thank you. Thank and you. we hope everyone has a wonderful, happy holiday season. And I just have to make this pitch because we are a nonprofit. If you are um, going to be doing any end of year giving, please consider making a donation to the Lake Apacon Foundation to continue to support us. Thank you all very much and have a wonderful holiday. Have a Thanks. Good Thanks, everyone. Happy Thanks holidays. Thanks for organizing. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Fred. Thank you. Yep. Take care, all.